breakdown of grades, no scaling as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I don't think I'm going to do anything with that. Uh, not going to spend too much time on this, but grading criteria, I'm going to grade you a little bit on actual documentation, so make sure you're putting comments at the top of any function that you write explaining what it does. Uh, using meaningful variable names, you know, not just saying int x if it's an important variable that you need for your entire program. If it's just something small, then that's whatever. Um, you know, and then I think 60% is what I decided on for, like, actually solving the problem that we're going to give you. Um, and then just, you know, the standard stuff like this. You'll, you'll lose 40 points if your program either doesn't compile or generates a seg fault uh, or a core dump you know, general memory issues. And uh, the other thing I guess to consider is that um, we are going to run every single program through MOS, which is a Stanford program that checks basically, are you plagiarizing things? Um, and we're checking specifically this semester, we're also checking Chegg and like online answers. So, you know, I don't strictly advise like not going to a website like Chegg or Stack Overflow if you're looking for like how do I program this because that's that's totally fine but copying and pasting the code that's not allowed so um, you can totally use the internet for reference but not use their code if that makes sense and we will check against that so be aware and then you know the rest of this I've pretty much just taken from Dr. Fonseca's um, syllabus if you've taken one of his classes before um, rest of this is just, you know, standard syllabus stuff. You're allowed to collaborate with students in the aspect that, you know, you can talk about the assignment, but you can't give each other code. And that's actually part of the, the reason we have the Discord is just, you know, if you have questions, you can ask pretty much any of the instructors for this course, or you can, you know, ask a question and see if somebody in one of the other classes or in this section, too, you know, has an answer to it. Uh, the rest of this is pretty standard. I'm sure you've seen it if you've taken any UNLV course, and I think that's about it to the syllabus. Any questions on that? I hope it's pretty straightforward. Sounds good. Okay. Fair enough. So then, I guess I will quit. close that. Oh yeah, other thing to mention. Um, I am going to record all the lectures and upload them to YouTube, and I'll post that in the Discord as well. So, you know, definitely make sure you're in the Discord, because I think it's very helpful, actually. Um, yeah, so I'm going to record this, and, you know, if you missed some of it, because, understandably, coming in late today, um, then you can always catch up on it there. Okay, so I'm going to close the syllabus then. So I pulled up an IDE, really just wanted to review C++. And then, you know, if we have extra time, we'll talk about function overloading. So it's going to be a little bit boring today. All the stuff that you've seen in 135 with the exception of vectors. So let me zoom in a little bit. That was control plus. Maybe it's not. So I, I prepared an example, and we'll work through that. Um, maybe I should even pull up the first homework. I put that on Canvas yesterday. It's basically all just review. There's only one new class that we want you guys to be using, um, which is a vector library. Am I just blind? There's got to be like a zoom in thing, right? I thought it was control plus. Uh, window? You know, if I'm just missing something, I'm just blinding it, you know. Let me know. Toolbars, other windows. Does this work? Oh, okay, scrolling works. Can everybody see the code okay? Is that big enough? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Sounds good. And if it's too small, you know, just stop me. Oh, let me make sure other people are waiting to get admitted. Oh, uh, we almost have everybody. I'll put this down here. I guess it's not that intrusive. Okay. So, yeah, let's go over first the assignment that uh, you guys are going to have to do, and then we'll go through an example that I wrote up. 
So let me find it really quick. Okay. So this assignment's up on Canvas already. I'll just basically go over it. We won't talk too much about it. Um, but it's C++ review. Basically, you're going to be given an input file. It's uh, cars.csv, which I also have here, which uh, if you have Microsoft Excel, it'll open that way. But know if you open this in like a text editor, so if I open this with Notepad++, uh, you'll notice it's structured a bit differently. Well, I guess it's basically the same. So uh, we have this list of cars. So it'll have the first column you can kind of ignore. That's just uh, a thing that CSV files have where it just tells you what the name of a field is. So the first field is car, the miles per gallon, cylinders, displacement, horsepower, weight, model, origin. So you're, what you're going to want to do is create a struct, and there is skeleton code for this already, uh, but create a struct that houses all of this stuff and then stores all this information. So every single row is going to have each of these things and you'll just need to read them in uh, in a loop. So for instance, the name of this car is, oh, that's probably kind of hard to see, huh? Uh, the name of this car is Chevrolet Chevelle Malibu. And then it's got 18 displacement, 8 horsepower weight. So everything is separated by, in this case, a semicolon, I guess. Um, so we'll go over just generally how to do that, how to parse this. And then, really, you can disregard this first line because we already know what we're going to be reading in. But again, this is all on the canvas. Okay. So we're going to read all that in into uh, a list of structs, uh, or I guess I should say vector, a vector of structs, and we'll get into what a vector is in a little bit. It's basically just an array, but we can change the size of it. So we're going to read all of those into that, and in fact the skeleton code already has all of the, the fields that you need, so you basically just need to do the reading yourself. And then we're just going to write a couple functions that do stuff with it. So um, You'll need to do some sorting by the miles per gallon field, some sorting by HP. I don't know what that is, but I assume that's one of the the parts that they have up here. Oh, horsepower. Okay. Um, and then basically printing it all out. And there is already a print function made for you. And then writing all of it to file. And there's sample output for both uh, a normal run and then actually you know, printing this all out to a file. And on top of that, we want to have some sort of user interface. So um, there will be a menu basically where you ask which one of these features do you want to do? Do you want to sort and then print, sort this type and then print, or save it to a file? And you'll, you'll notice it's in the actual sample output uh, as to what that looks like. So you basically just see in until you get an exit flag. Uh, basic description of all the functions. I will probably let you guys read over all that. And then, yeah, basically just make sure it compiles on Sally or Bobby or one of the school servers. And then uh, I have a submission on Canvas, so submit it there. And if you have any questions further on it, I, I know I'm just kind of like hand-waving me like, yeah, this is easy. But, you know, if it's, if it's not and if you need review on C++, you know, don't be afraid to ask. So basically, we, we just want to create a vector of cars, and again, we'll go over what a vector is, and then write these functions to sort and print them, and then write them to a file. Um, I feel like there's one last thing. Oh, right. For the sorting part, I feel like it's important to mention. We, or you, you can use any sorting algorithm that you want. So you can use bubble sort or selection sort is what I recommend, because those, I think, are the easier <coughs> sorting algorithms. Um, but... If you're familiar with like merge sort or selection sort, then you can use that too. But if you don't, that's totally okay. Any questions on that at all? I know I just kind of briefly went over it. And then I think this is due next Friday. It's about two weeks to do it. Okay. So I think I have no questions. And if, if you do, just interrupt me. Um, so let's just go over a sample program, really, just to remember how to do some C++. So I have something prepared. I think I have it open somewhere. At least I thought I did. 
Will you go over vectors? Yeah, I'm going to in a moment. We just figured it's probably a good idea to teach everybody about vectors because uh, pretty much every language has something similar to it and it's very useful. So let's just say we're working at a supermarket and similar to that cars example, uh, we have like a list of things. So in this example, we have a list of items. So the items are going to have their SKU, which is like an ID that we use to identify them, the name of the product, its price, and then the count of how much uh, that thing that we have. And so really we just want to maybe read this in and then let's just say sort it by quantity and then print it out. So let's just, oh, I guess I've been a little bit slow on admitting people. Hopefully they weren't waiting too long. Um, but yeah, just for the, for the people who just joined, um, we're just going over an example of of reading in. So there's an assignment on Canvas. Um, you know, make sure to check that. Make sure to join the Discord. And then we're going over an example of C++ review. And again, this is recorded, so you can go back and rewatch it if you missed some of it. Um, yeah, so it's going to be a list with the, the SKU, which is an ID, the name of the item, price, and then the actual count of it. So let's write a program really quick that reads in all of these things and then sorts them by the count, just to, to have like a simple thing here. Okay, so let's go back and let's just comment that in really quick. This program will read Maybe we'll even just write it to a file. Um, and sort by quantity. Okay. So as a reminder, if you need any sort of libraries, remember it's include and then the name of the library. For this one, we're going to be using vector, which is the new class that we're going to go over. And then everything else is pretty much just for printing or uh, file and strings. Okay. So remember that when we declare a struct, it's always struct and then the name of the struct. So I'll name this one something like item. And then in C++, we always put a semicolon after the actual declaration. Okay, so if you remember from what we were just looking at, we had skew, name, price, quantity. So I'll do int skew, uh, and then it was the name, right? And then for price, and uh, the last one was quantity. So just a reminder, that's how we do a struct. And then does anybody remember, so I'm going to want to do some command line arguments. Does anybody remember what um, the arguments look like for that? What are my two arguments I typically have in main? Yeah, good job, right? So uh, we have argc and argv. Um, and so argc is the argument count, and then argv is an argument vector, which just contains everything. So I'll do an example of that really quick in a second here. Um, our pointer pointer, argv. Cool. Yeah, so good job. That's right. Um, so this just says how many arguments we have, and then this is the actual list of arguments. So as an example, if I wrote dot slash a dot out, and then sample one dot txt, help if I could spell, what is my argc and what's my argv for this one? Because there's something important to remember for this, I guess. Right, you're both kind of close. You're right, argc is 2. Actually, you're very close. Um, argc is 2, so remember, it, it might seem a little bit strange, but uh, this is actually included in the argument count. So the argument count includes your program name, so it would actually just be a dot out, and then um, the second argument we had. So every time you put a space, it'll count that as an argument. 
So we have two arguments, and then argument vector is going to contain, so this is at zero. So argv sub zero is a dot out as a string. So remember everything is a string, even though it says character star star, and we'll go over what that star means on a different day. Um, that means a string, basically. So argv zero is a dot out, and argv one is uh, sample dot text, and they're both strings, just remember. So whenever we need an integer, so if I was to put like five after this, then we're going to have to do some conversion from a string to an integer because that's actually argv sub two is five. So just remember that, I suppose. Yeah, argument count is the, yep. Yeah, in most languages you do start counting at zero. Um, some languages let you define where you want to start, like Python. Uh, but just in general, yeah, remember that we're, we'll start counting from zero. And we'll get into that when we create a vector here in a second. So hopefully that was all straightforward. I know I just deleted it. Maybe I'll just leave this in as a comment in case anybody needs to look at it. Nobody else needs admitted? Oh, we pretty much got everybody. That's good. Okay. Yeah. So when we want to do command line arguments, we need an argument count and an argument vector. And you don't have to put these if you're not going to use command line arguments, but uh, for this upcoming program, and let's just say the one that we're writing right now, we kind of want it. Okay, so we want to read in a file of these items like this, right? So not strictly necessary, but I would kind of like you guys to do it, is to make sure that the person who used your program actually did it correctly. So I need to make sure that they actually gave me the correct amount of arguments, and then I need to open the file afterwards, right? And make sure that the file actually exists and they're not just lying or made a typo or something like that. So what we'll first do is say something like, if argc does not equal two, then we'll say error needs one argument. So if they basically didn't give us just the one argument we needed, which is the file name, we should tell them it's bad. And then remember in C++, the way you exit out of a program is you return something from main. So recall that return zero is a normal return. It means that the program exited normally. And if I do return one, which makes more sense in this case, it means that there was an error encountered while running the program. So those are just the system codes um, needed for actually running. Okay, so I'll just put a comment up there. Make sure the user gave the correct argument count, and then we just need to make sure that that argument is actually, you know, good. So does anybody remember the class that we use for, or struct, maybe it's a struct, um, that we use for reading in input files? Iostream. Uh, so Iostream is actually a library. That one's for like C out, actually. Yeah, Fstream. There you go. Right, and Fstream's, uh, Fstream's a library, so we're going to use a specific class from Fstream. But yeah. Uh, so just know, Iostream is for a different kind of stream. So stream just means like a place you read or write from. Um, Iostream is like C out, C in. And actually, one thing I wanted to note, because I think it's important, and I know I was confused about it when I took this class, you, you notice we always put that using namespace standard. You don't necessarily need that, and you might see a lot of errors online that say something like, something about C out. You're actually allowed to do this. Um, C out is something that belongs to this namespace, which we'll go over later, what namespaces are, called standard. So if you ever see like standard colon colon, it's really just the same C out, it just means that it belongs to standard. Um, and we'll go over that more later. I just think that's important because that shows up a lot in compiler errors, and I know it was confusing to me for the longest time. Uh, but as everybody was saying, we know that there is the fstream class, or fstream library, which contains an input file stream and an output file stream. So ifstream, that's input file stream, and then ofstream is output file stream. So we'll just name it something like infile. Remember when we're declaring variables, we always put the type and then the name of it, and then it just exists now. And it does some other secret stuff that we'll go over later. Okay, so now we have a input file stream, and we want to open a file, right? Uh, running out of time? 
great. Thanks, Zoom. Um, I didn't even know there was a 40 minute time limit. That would have sucked. So we want to open this. Um, I know I said we were going to do argument check or um, error checking on this, but in the interest of keeping it simple, let's just assume that they typed it incorrectly. And we'll probably get a core dump if they didn't. So the file that's at argv1, right? We said up here that that's going to be the file name. So now we've opened the file and we can actually start reading from it. Okay. So the way I'm going to recommend reading this is with a function called get line. So we know, and we could even look at the struct because I did it in this order. We're, it's always going to be the SKU, the name, the price, the count. So we can always read in the same order. There's not really any trickery. So we'll just kind of not hard code it, but you know, always go in that order. So if you remember, if we want to check that the file actually still has stuff, then we want to do while in file dot end of file. So you have EOF is a flag that gets set when you actually reach the end of a, a file. And it's important to consider that if you read the last line, it's not end of file yet until you actually read after that. So if I read, oh, somebody else is waiting. Um, if I read this line, then I need to read this nothing here in order for it to actually register that there's an end of file. So just something to consider. So in good practice, it's usually a good idea to read in right before you start doing a loop like this, just to make sure that you're not reading in like an empty file or something. So what we'll do is, I might even pull this up because I have another example of it as well. Oh, I, I guess I should do another thing too. Um, which is make a vector. Let me open up another thing too, just to make sure I have this exact syntax right. Um, I don't have it open. I did already write this code in advance, so we do have that. Um, yeah, that would be good practice too, is to have a function that actually reads stuff. So you notice I have a thing here that's just called read item. Let's read straight in. Oh, you know what? That's fine. Yeah, I should have done this a little differently. I'll come back to it in a little bit. Just remind me. Um, I, I set up this file a little bit differently than the one for your homework. So it's uh, yeah, probably a better idea to go over that too. But for the time being, we'll just exploit a problem with this. So what I'm going to do is I know I want a list of all these things and I want to store them together. So normally you use an array for that, right? Uh, Jimmy Vasco taught vectors. Yeah, I don't think most people taught vectors in 135. Uh, in fact, I never learned about vectors in 202 either, but I figured it would be a good thing to go over. So I'm just going to explain what it is. It, it's, um, it's basically just an array, really. Um, but it resizes itself. So the unfortunate thing about like when you're doing programs in 135, right, is that you either had to read in a number from the top of the file that said, hey, there's going to be this many things, or you had to read in twice, count how many things there are, and then read through, and then you know allocate the array and do all that stuff. Um, and it's kind of annoying to do that, and also a little bit inefficient if you're reading through twice. Um, so it's either annoying that you have to put a number at the top of the file, or you know, terrible that you have to read the file twice. So we can kind of get around that by using some uh, dynamic allocation, which is what the vector does, and we'll go over what that actually means later, um, probably in like a week or two. Um, but for the time being, just think of it like a list. In fact, that's what it's called in most other languages, it's just called a list. So when you want to declare a vector of, of a specific type, you put vector and then left angle bracket, whatever the name of the thing is, right angle bracket. So in this case, I'm going to make a vector of the struct we had called item. So we had the struct up here, uh, which is what we're wanting to read in. And I'm just going to create a list of this, basically. So just consider if I wanted like a vector of ints, like a list of ints, I could do something like that. 
or if I wanted a list of you know file names or files uh, I guess that stream is fine oh whoops not vector then I could do something like this so we'll also go over what this means later but uh, left bracket right bracket whenever you have in that it will make that thing basically hold that type of object so in this example, we want a vector of items. Okay. So I want to read in the items now, right? So I'll just create a temporary item. It's usually a bad idea to declare variables inside of a loop, but I'm doing this for a reason. And then we'll just read it in. So we know, again, earlier, we know it's always the SKU name price quantity. So... Oh, right, and I said that we need to read first, right? Hmm. What would be the easiest way to do this? Did I do something smart here? No, I didn't. <laughs> that did work, though. I don't know why. Okay, well, whatever. We'll just do this the standard way. I'll go over the other way in a little bit. I guess I, I did it kind of janky. Um, so remember... Oh, whoops that in order to read from something we use the right right the extraction operator and to print something you use the left left which is uh the in no other way around this is the insertion operator the other one's the extraction operator so we're going to take things from the file and then we know that the order we wanted in was skew oops uh name uh, price. I call it quantity. Yeah. Okay. So just remember that if I want to access something that belongs to a struct or a class, which we'll get into a little bit, uh, shouldn't it be why you're right? My bad. Thank you for that catch. So why we're not at the end of the file. Thank you. Um, yeah. So while we're not at the end of the file, we'll keep reading in. And then just remember, as a reminder, that the way you access members of a struct or a class is with that operator. So this will get the skew of this specific item. In fact, let me just call this temp item just to be clear on the name. So I, I made an item called temp item, and then I store in its skew name price quantity from the file. Is the item in vector item the struct? So I guess there's there's something abstract here about this, um, and we'll get into it more later. But a struct or a class is really just a description of something that you want. So when I say struct item, I mean that it is like a thing that has a skew name price and quantity but it doesn't really like exist or so the struct i guess doesn't exist um that's where you get instances so if i said like item temp item and then item item two these are both instances i have the item class so these are like actual objects that have the skew the name the price the quantity um and they're like tangible, I can interact with them. Whereas this is just kind of like a description of these things, if that makes sense. So is item in vector item the struct? Uh, hopefully that answers your question. And then the item is, the item here, I guess, is the name of the struct that's going to have its objects inserted into it. Hopefully that, that answered your question. I, I hope I didn't miss that. Um, but we're going to be storing this item in uh, in there as well. Vector is an accessible version of a struct. So a, a vector is a a vector is like an array. So it's it's a struct that contains some information. It contains an array. It contains the size of the array, and then probably some other stuff too. So um, you could have a struct that also contains structs, right? So I could. I could even have made something up here called like struct list 
and that would have contained like an array of items. So let's just say item items. I'm pretty sure that syntax is fine. Yeah. So you can contain like a, a struct of struct. So I, I have like a new struct here. This one contains that struct. Um, that's totally fine. So the, the the vector, whenever you do any of these include things, you're really just pulling from a code base that somebody else has written. Somebody's written a struct or class, it might be, um, called vector that stores lists of things similar to an array. Although there's one key difference, which is what I'm about to write here. Um, which is that, so whenever I want to add something to the list, right now, this vector is completely empty. I just created it here, and then I didn't do anything with it. Um, so it's really just an array of size zero. So in order to actually add things to it, we'll use the pushback function. So remember, dot accesses things of it. So I have this vector. If I do dot pushback, and then I do that with temp item, what this will do is it will add the created item to the vector. So this will take the item I just added and then push it to the back, or basically add it to the end of a list. Um, let me actually pull open something really quick so I can demonstrate this a little bit easier. Where did I even put that? There it is. So just for the sake of the argument, because I think this is a, a very important class, so it's good to know. Uh, or struct. Whatever it is. Work area. Okay. So, I know, let's just say I have like item one Say it's 405 steak. It's three dollars and seventy-five cents, and I have six of them. And then I make another one called item two. And these are both examples of the item struct that I defined earlier. Um, three six two carat four fifteen. And I have eight of them. So when I create a, a vector, what it does is it just creates a list. It might even be, as far as you, like, you're concerned when you create it, it's a size of zero, but they might have actually made space already um, just to save a bit of time um, to put things into it. So when I do vector item, I think I just called it items. So when I do items dot pushback, sorry, I kind of ran out of space here, but this is supposed to be one line, item one. What it does is it says, and it has a size as well, it says, well, I'm going to put that into this list. So it goes here. It takes a pointer to this, which we'll go over what that is later. But basically just takes the item and throws it into the, the vector. So it puts it in there. And then if we were to do the same thing with the next one, items to dot, or items dot push back. item two, then what that does is it adds the next item into the next slot. So it'll just keep putting things at the end, uh, basically just creating a list. So if I then, you know, pushed item four, yeah, it's like an array, right? Yep. Is everybody clear on that? Just want to make sure everybody understands what a vector is. So I could, you know, like put item four if that was the next thing I pushed in. So if that's clear, um, it just always puts it at the end, wherever that is. And then it, it will, I haven't been doing it, but it'll update the size. So after it adds the first one, it'll be one, then it'll be two, and then it'll be three. So it just keeps track of 
how many things are in it, which is nice because, um, like I was saying earlier, that means that we don't, whoa, open up browser. Uh, we don't have to like actually keep track of everything or like the number of things that there's going to be. So here, this is going to create each item that we're getting from the file and then push them onto the vector. So we're going to get a list of like item one, item two, item three, item four, item five. Everybody clear on that or any questions on vectors? It's really the one new thing I wanted to go over today. Why is that beneficial in comparison to an array? Um, well, consider if, if I was reading things in with an array. Um, I have to do one of two things. I either need to know... So when I, when I declare an array, like this, it values, let's just say, when I... Ooh, control A. When I do something like this, I'm hard stuck on whatever the number is uh, for for that item, or for that, that array. So there's a couple problems with that. One, if I'm reading in from a file, I have to contain the number of things that are going to be in the file at the top if I want to know what time it is. Yeah, boundaries uh, basically is the problem. So we have to either know the boundaries in advance, uh, an alternative would be we read in the entire file, count how many things there are, and then read through the file a second time to actually put them into the array. And that's really bad because that's reading twice. Or we could also read them into a, just a huge array and then transfer them over to a smaller array that's the correct size. Uh, but that's just inefficient because we waste space. So this, this way, it's nice if we use a, a vector it, it's a little bit slower when it's actually adding things in because it has to decide, oh, I need more space now every time you actually add something in, which is a little bit bad compared to the array where you just you make a fixed amount of space and then you're done. Um, but it comes with the advantage of you can resize it at any point. You don't have to you know, know the size in advance. You don't have to do any extra reading. Um, it's dynamic. It's able to accommodate pretty much any time or uh, any like size and any item that you want and maybe even at some point you know you read in 10 values into an array and then you want to make it bigger and then you can't you either have to make a new array or you know you had to start the array and then you know maybe you don't know what the size of it is in advance and you know uh you don't really necessarily yeah it's it's, it's very useful if if you don't know what the size is of something in advance um then vectors and lists is what they're called usually in other languages are very, very useful. I use them very frequently um, when I'm doing app development because I don't know exactly. So what I, what I do there is, um, you know, pull a, a list of things from the server. I don't know what the list of that or like the length of the list of that things is. So I put them into a list because, you know, or a vector because you know, it, I have no idea what it's going to be, and if I took the time to figure it out on my own, I'd be wasting a lot of computation time that I could, you know, be doing more useful things with. So hopefully that, that answers that question. Any other questions on vectors? Okay, yeah, stop me at any point if, if anybody has any other questions. So... Let me just comment this. I can post the finished code on Canvas too if anybody wants to see it. Um, and then read in the members. Okay. So we've read in all the stuff from that file that I, I did. So it'll basically read till the end of file. I think this is actually... I, I know it worked because I ran it earlier, but this doesn't feel like it should work. I feel like the end of file is not going to get triggered correctly um maybe i'm just crazy maybe it works i don't know but let's just keep it simple for the time being we'll come back to it in a little bit uh so we read that in and then we said we want to maybe just sort everything and uh and then print it out okay so let's go over functions really quick so i didn't do this as a function but it's a good idea to actually do it and you'll have to do it for your program um, but remember that C++ is a little bit strange. The compiler only runs through your code once. So I always recommend, and you know, don't make this mistake like I did. 
always put your declarations after your namespaces because you might get some compiler errors and if you're like me and just didn't really understand namespaces for a while um, you know you just be confused as to why it's not compiling so make sure you're always putting it after the namespace so in, uh, yeah what I was saying C++ is weird because the compiler has to make one pass which is different from a lot of other languages so if you remember we have to have these function prototypes and we're gonna be doing a lot of these when we get to classes um, kind of inconvenient and it's just a relic of the way C++ works. The compiler is a little bit faster because of it, but it's kind of annoying to actually program. So um, let's say I want to have a sort function. So we'll say void sort items. I guess I'm not going to do any value returning ones, but that's okay. Sort items, and then we will take in a vector of items. So remember in C++, you don't have to put the name of it when you do the, the function prototype. So we need to give it a name, basically just to say, we're going to use this function later, just so the compiler knows. Because it only does one pass, and it needs to see all the names when it gets to them. Okay, and then maybe we'll do another one that is just called print item. And that one will just take an individual item. So you might notice there's something wrong with one of my two functions that's well something's wrong with this apparently declaration is compatible with print item oh whoops let's yeah oops i haven't declared item yet until this line so let's put it down one more um yeah something's wrong with one of these two things i'll let you see if you can figure it out um first what function is wrong and, and then why and I'll give you a hint it has to do with the fact that uh, one of these things needs to have its changes you know last after the function is done it might be a little bit of a hard question um, but one of them needs to Okay, yeah, actually somebody did catch it. Oh, two people caught it. Good good job. Um, I think, but I forget what they do. Yes, you go, you're, you're both right. Um, so remember, passing by reference. So I need the ampersand. Passing by reference means that I put the actual variable down into the function. So when I put this, this ampersand here, that means that I'm going to send the actual vector item type whatever it is uh, whatever item that is or type uh, what, what's the word I'm looking for instance the actual instance to the function when I call it and if I don't put the ampersand then it sends a copy of it which means that any changes that I do to it don't end up happening when I go back to wherever I called it from uh, so one of them means uh, that's what they call it. yeah pass by reference yeah right um, and so that's called pass by reference whereas the other one is pass by value so this one is an example of reference, and this one is by value. Because when I print an item, I don't really need to change it at all, right? Um, but when I do a sorting uh, algorithm, then it's a good idea to actually swap the elements of my list, because if I don't, well, then when I get back to the original function, nothing's going to have changed. And just consider some things are passed by reference by default, uh, like arrays are passed by reference. Um, you don't. You can't even put an ampersand by it. The compiler will get mad at you. It just always does it. And uh, in a lot of languages, other than C++, something like this is already passed by reference, and you don't have to do anything explicit. Uh, whenever you do anything that's a struct or a class, it always passes it by reference, um, which makes sense in the context of those languages. Okay. Everybody clear on that so far? And... If, if you know there's something I should probably be doing instead of passing by value to make things faster. But um, we'll maybe just leave that where it is. Pass by reference is for a copy. Sorry. I'm, oh, no, other way around. So there's pass by reference and pass by value. So pass by reference, like the name implies, pass by reference, which we'll get into what that means later, but it passes the actual variable. It just, it just, 
passes where it's located in memory, basically, uh, to the function for it to use. So whenever I do that ampersand, the pass by reference, it uses that actual variable. But if I do a pass by value, then I have to physically make a copy of it, and then that gets passed to the function. Um, and then any changes that happen to that won't get reflected when I finish that call. Okay. So we, we said we want to sort this item, or sort the items. So we'll just call that. Remember, just to call a function, you just give the name and then whatever it is that you're calling it with. So I will call it with items. So this will sort the items. And so a good thing to consider when you're doing you know, just general programming is that you want whatever code it is that does something to be kind of like self-contained. So when I write sort items, I don't want to do anything extra that helps with the sorting in main. I want to do all that sorting in the actual function itself. So void sort items down here, which we will write out, um, which took a vector of items. Um, items to sort. I can name this anything, it's fine. Mm, sort of matches the argument. Oh, whoops. I gotta make sure I put the, the reference there, right? Because that's what the original was. Yeah, so all the sorting should happen all down here. I expect all that to happen. Really, what you, you kind of want to envision is that there's a black box. Whenever I call sort items, where I'm just, you know, I can't see what code is in the actual sort items function, I expect it to sort, and then I expect it to come back sorted correctly. So it should just do work, however mysterious it is. It should just do that work, do it correctly, and then when it's done, it should be, you know, correct. So you, when you, whenever you write a function, it should just do some code. You know, you don't have to know exactly what it is. Just expect it to return the correct thing. So right now, we'll just sort the items. Um, anybody want to go over any specific sorting algorithm? Um, we can do bubble sort or selection sort. I'm not going to do merge sort or, or quick sort, because I think that's way beyond the scope of this class. Anybody have a, a preference? Bubble? Yeah? OK. Let's do bubble sort. Um, I encourage everybody, because I don't think they teach it in 135, to look up selection sort, because I think it's kind of easy to understand, but bubble sort is a little bit faster. Barely used it. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, we do sorting a lot, just in general in computer science. Um, yeah. So, bubble sort, I won't spend too much time on it just because we only have a few minutes. But, um, basically the idea is we want to compare two things and then always move the biggest one to the end, right? In the interest of time, I do already have it written out, but I'll just explain it really quick. That is the one I did when I did this program originally. Okay, there's that. Different name, items to sort. So there's actually a couple things to go over. Oh, that's annoying. Uh, let me just make this easier. Let's name this items instead of items to sort. So just know that this items here is different than that items there. Because uh, that's a point of confusion I see from a lot of people. Whenever you start a function, whatever variable, this is almost like writing the line by itself. You're declaring a variable called items and it exists only in between these curly braces. You're, just, you're creating a variable and it exists for that function only. If you have the same name anywhere else, they're not the same one. Um, unless you're passing by value, or sorry, passing by reference, but even then, they're not really the same one, it's just passing a, a reference of it. Okay, um, so a couple things. So for, for bubble sort and selection sort both, you will need two counter variables. Normally people do like for int i, for int j. Uh, I usually do it outside. There's a reason why I do that, but we'll just, you know, assume it's just because I'm crazy for now. Um, but if, if you put it on the inside, totally fine. Probably easier to read. It's just a little more efficient this way. Um, so we need to do two things. So let me, oh, I closed it. Let me just do a quick explanation. I'm not going to go too in-depth, 
but just know my internet connection is unstable. Are we required to put our function specifically before or after main, or can we choose? Uh, you can put it anywhere. I usually recommend after main, but it's not really a big deal. You can put it wherever. Um, I should make sure this isn't sorted. One, three, one, four. So remember that when I do bubble sort, I have two pointers. So let's just say this is i and it's zero, and then j is one. And we'll just call this r. So remember what we do in really well, pretty much any sorting algorithm, at least comparison based, we take i uh, and we basically just check is one bigger than the other. Depends on whatever order you want to put it in. Let's say we want to go in uh, non-descending order. We want this to be like smallest to biggest. Um, then we know if if the second one, r sub j, is bigger than r sub i. And actually, I, I guess I didn't mention it, but remember that you know these square brackets. That means that we're accessing an element at that position. So r sub zero that's three r sub one is one and r sub two is four so remember that we start counting at zero and that the number inside the square brackets that corresponds to its position not the actual value because i see a lot of people confused about that this is always the counting number that you are into the thing okay um but we, we basically want to say, if, if they're out of order, so if r sub j, which is this one, is bigger than r sub i. No, all the way around. Oops. It'd help if I actually did things correctly. If r sub i is bigger than r sub j. So if they're in the wrong order, right? If the first one is bigger than the second one, then we know, you know, they're not in non-descending order, uh, then we want to swap them. Otherwise, we don't do anything. Right? And then the next thing we do is we just, we make j go up. So this is all in the context of the for loop, right? So it'll move j from here to here. So that first one, that will swap it, right? We'll say something like this happens, this becomes one, that becomes three, and then it compares these two. So we move both i and j up and then check them there. Oops. Is that pretty clear? So in this case, I would check three against four, nothing would happen, so I would, wouldn't swap them. Should hopefully remember it from 135. I'm Probably just going to leave it at that, but does anybody have any questions on that? Basically, we just compare every two next to each other, and then just swap. Is that how we use that? I haven't seen that before. I'm just calling it swap. I have the actual code. No, it's not. In, it's not in C++. Oh, good question. Yeah, don't do that. You'll notice that there's a problem. I, I wrote my code specifically to avoid that. So you, you can make a function called swap if you really want to. Uh, I just throw that out there vaguely. Again, assuming there's like some black box, I know that there's some function out there called swap that always does the right thing. I don't have to worry about what the actual code inside of it is. Um, but it's not, not actually in C++. So what happens if I just do x equals y? Like, well, let's just say r, r i equals r j. And I just do vice versa. Why doesn't this work? Lose your number. Yeah, exactly. So if I did this, then we would do, so let's just say this was I, this was J. You have to make a copy. Yep, exactly. So we'll need to do a copy. Um, if I did that, I would do R sub I, which is this one, equals J first, right? So I'd set this equal to one. Now they're both one. We lost the three. It's gone. Um, so make sure you are saving a copy 
otherwise you're going to get something like this, where you end up losing it, and then you'll end up getting a sorted array that's all just one number, and you're, you'll be super confused uh, as to why that's happening. So make sure you have that. Good. Thank you for pointing that out. So declare another int for copies, right? And you'll, so you'll notice I did that exactly here. So I wrote bubble sort, basically what we just wrote. So we have i, which is the first index, the, uh, the kind of like arrow that was pointing in that list or that array. And then I had j, which is pointing to the second one. So they move along at the same time, right? And uh, they check. So what this does is we want to compare exactly based off of the skew, right? So I check, is the second one greater than the one next to it? Actually, you'll notice I just did j, j plus one, which is probably a lot easier. Um, actually, in fact, definitely do it this way. Ignore the fact that I had two there, uh, and it was incrementing them. That's actually bad. Um, I, in this case, just represents how many things have been sorted already. Um, I'll maybe send a video about that. I just don't want to spend too much time because I want to get through all of this if I can today. Um, yeah, so like everybody was saying earlier, or somebody was saying, we want to keep a vari or a copy variable of it. So what I do is I take item sub j. You could pick any one you want. I just pick the first one. And then I overwrite it. So I save a copy of it, overwrite it, and then I put that copy into the actual, um, you know, space that it needs to swap into. So you should always have, always have three lines for that. And then you'll notice, if, if you remember uh, your bubble sort, there's a way we can optimize it, where we basically say is sorted. We set that equal to true every single loop, and we break out if we know that the list is sorted. So when we're running through, if we don't do any swaps, then we know that there's not going to be any more swaps to do the entire run of the program or the, the algorithm. So we just bail early, and we say uh, is sorted is true, and that means that we don't have to keep sorting. So uh, vice versa, if I flip my thinking around, if I do do a swap while I'm running through the list, then I know it's not sorted. So I want to mark that that happens. So um, yeah, only uh, two other things just to mention really quick. Um, note that because it is by reference, all of this swapping that I do is actually going to reflect itself back to wherever I call the function, which in this case was a main. And then the other thing to consider is, like, we didn't even, or I didn't even acknowledge it. Um, and we really didn't even have to think about it that much. Notice that I'm using the vector like an array. I'm just putting the left, right square brackets like you normally would with those things. So the way you use a vector after you've put things into it, same way you would use an array. And you can check how long it is at any point by using dot size, and then make sure you put, it's a function call, so it has the left, right basis. Um, any questions on vectors in particular? That's just the last thing to mention about them. So when we put things into it, we use pushback, like here. And when we access things out of it, we use something like the actual array. And we'll go over how you actually create your own classes that can do this, probably like week 10, somewhere around there. Any questions on on the vector part? I'm not going to go too much detail on bubble sort. I'm sorry. I, I just don't want to spend too much time on it. I'll post maybe like a, a visualization of it in the Discord. Okay, I don't see any questions, but again, just interrupt me if you have any questions. Okay, so last thing we want to do is just print each individual thing. So I made something called print item above, and again I said it was kind of bad practice to pass things by value ever, and that there's something else I should do, and we'll talk about that if we have time in a second. If not, you'll see that we, we do it a lot in the programming assignments, so I'll probably bring it up then. Um, yeah, so print item, that one should be pretty straightforward. Want to print the item? So, I mean, this one I don't think I have to explain too much. Just print maybe the skew item to print. Obviously, you don't want ridiculously long names like this. It's just for the sake of an example. 
So as you remember, in C++, we have this weird um, weird extraction operator thingy that we put in between everything that we want to print. So this will print each of the things that I'm typing with spaces in between. You put a dollar sign in front of that. Okay, and then item to print the quantity that's kind of long and then remember C++ has this weird thing that belongs to standard called end line that ends the line uh, but you can always put backslash in so I mean, hopefully this code is pretty straightforward it just prints the thing so actually maybe I should add one thing in here just to make the program easier so I'm printing it to C out, but let's say I want to print it to a file instead. So what I can do is I can add a second thing here. I usually want to do it by reference. And O stream as opposed to OF stream is an output stream. So output stream could mean C out, it could mean a file, um, it could be pretty much anything. So I'm going to uh, uh, write it to an output stream and then I'll reflect that down here. Okay. So if I didn't want it to always print to the screen, I could maybe put that there. And then we'll see how that affects things in a second. Okay, so if I want to print things, so if I wanted to print to see out now, I could type print item. Actually, we want to go through all of the items in the vector, right, and print them. So I need to do something like for int i equals zero i less than items dot size i plus plus print item uh, the item was items sub i right so we just access each individual member so it starts counting at zero ends at size so this will print zero then one uh, items zero items one items two so on and so forth and then I said I wanted to print it to C out. So what this will do is it'll take this C out. You'll notice I did it by reference right here, right? So it will take C out and it will just put it into that. So this OS, when I call it with C out, it gives C out to that and it's an exact reference to C out. So it'll just basically replace it when it's executed. So this will print all the items. And that's basically all we have to do. So maybe we want to see how this runs and just remember how to compile things really quick. Uh, party. Let me open up a couple windows here. So many windows open. Uh, make sure I open this. Where did that go? Okay. So I didn't show it, but I, I transferred the file that we just wrote to Sally. Okay. Hopefully this isn't too hard to see either. I can't really change the size after I started running it. But remember, if you want to compile something, it's just G++ is the compiler we use. If you're using uh, Visual Studio like I am, we can actually just hit this button here, but I w want to make sure you know how to do the terminal part. Um, G++. And then we type in the name of the file, which I haven't provided yet. Let me transfer that to the server really quick. Okay. Actually, oh, yes, I have. Um, so the, the name of the source file I have here was called CS section. So if I just do G++ CS section dot CPP to compile, hopefully no errors. And then remember that whenever you do that, it creates a executable and by default the name is a.out but you can rename it 
if you know you know a way to do it there's a bunch of different ways um, so if I just wanted to run this you'll notice if I type in dot slash a dot out it doesn't work because I had that error checking up here right that said error needs one argument it catches that so if I said uh, dot slash a dot out sample one dot txt yeah there it goes it prints all the stuff from that file right. same stuff and then it sorted it by oh it didn't I must have made a mistake somewhere. Or did I sort it by skew? Is that what I said? I said I wanted to do it by quantity, and then I didn't actually do it. Well, it's sorted by skew. You'll notice... Yeah. Yeah, it works. I mean, there's, there's all, it should work. I already tested it earlier. Um, yeah, so this sorted it by skew. We'll, say that's, we'll pretend that's what we wanted to do. If we wanted to do it by quantity, we just changed the name to quantity, right? Okay. Um, yeah, so... Then, let's say I want to write this to a file instead. So let's say now I want to, I'm going to give a second argument, and that argument is going to be the name of the output I want. So let's say, for instance, I called it like this. I said output.txt. No, something like this, right? Okay. So let's open uh, a file right here. So we need to do it before we actually print, right? And so I just, I'm just doing this to demonstrate how we can change a function. So remember, ifstream was for input files. In C++, ofstream is for output files. So I will do one called outfile here. And I will open it. And I will open it. Again, we're not going to do any error checking. I'm just going to be lazy with the second argument. And you'll notice now if I do this. I can replace C out, and you'll you'll see that it actually is going to print to a file. Um, anything else I needed to do? Oh yeah, a uh, good idea to close the input file that we open. Don't leave it open. Bad idea. Um, yeah, so let me just transfer that over. We'll run it really quick, and then I think we'll call it a day. And then I'll post this on Canvas, I guess, later. I'll post the different version that I wrote. I think it's more commented. Just because I think that's probably better. Okay. Right, so I transferred it to the server. Okay, remember that you need to recompile it. So I need to do G++, CS section. Just as an aside, if you type in a letter and then hit tab in Linux, it will fill in the rest for you, so that's nice. And then I will run it. Uh, oh, I forgot to change one thing. We changed it to three arguments, right? I got to do that. Because now it takes an output file. All right. Recompile it one more time. And then also because I see so many people do it, don't, don't ever, you'll make me very angry. Uh, don't ever do something like this and write that into your program. You don't need the source. You already, look, this is an executable. The program's already compiled, so don't, don't put the source in there. I see a lot of people do that, um, but you know, you're just making your life harder. It's not going to do anything with it. Okay, yeah. And then I said, about, let's just name something like output.txt. And you should notice that we have something called output.txt now in my directory. And if I was to open that with cat output.txt, you'll see it's just the same thing we just printed to see out. And so I could run this again. I have another uh, sample file. We'll just run it on that one. And then you'll notice, uh, I didn't actually show it, but we, I have like another list and it, again, sorts these correctly by skew. This is just a general overview of the program and I guess we're at time. So last things to mention, make sure if you haven't joined the Discord already that you go onto Canvas. It's under the syllabus section. It's also under the first announcement. Just make sure you join the Discord. That's where I'm going to be hosting office hours. And if you have any questions, I'll try to answer them. I do have three classes after this, so, um, you know, I don't know when I'm going to be free exactly. And office hours are on Tuesdays, Thursdays, 12 to 3. Don't have a TA as far as I know. We're a little bit short given the current circumstances. Um, I think that's about it. And then I'll, I'll post this on YouTube later. Uh, can you please? Yeah, I can do that really quick. 
if anybody has any last questions, that's totally fine. Um, but if you have to go, like you have another class, go ahead and go. I just, I can stay a little bit after. Where, I do have that still open. Uh, I think the program froze. That's great. Oh, no, there it is. Okay. I think I closed it. But the idea with a, a vector for pushback, I could even draw it like this. 0, 1, 2, 3. Let's just call this vec of int. Say it's an integer vector. Well, OK. Uh, let me actually write it out the correct way. Let's say this is a vector of integers. Again, anything inside curly or uh, these angle brackets just means that the type could be whatever. Um, and we'll call it vec. So if I did vec dot push back four, let me just do three really quick. Vec dot push back. Back dot push back. Okay. So let me just do three numbers. So let's say I do four, seven, and six. So let's say I declare my array, or sorry, vector, although it is kind of an array. Um, declare my vector, and I push four, seven, and six to it. So when it starts, there's nothing inside the vector. It's just an empty list. It might actually exist in memory. Depends on their implementation. But it's just, it's just empty. Nothing in there. Uh, and if there is things in there, it's just random garbage. And we won't be able to do anything with it. Okay. So when I push the first thing into it, what it does is it goes into the vector and it looks for the first open position. So nothing's in it right now. So the first thing it's going to do is put it into zero. And now the size becomes one. Okay, so that's for that line. And if we did the next line, then it's going to push the number seven into there. So it's going to again look for the next open space, which is at one. It's going to put it into there. Paintbrush is a little off. And then it's going to update the size to 2 to let you know that there's two things inside of it. And then if we were to execute the next line of code, it's going to take the number 6. Again, I'm going to look for the first position, put it at the end, and then update the size. Does that make sense? It's basically just, it's a list, and you add things to the end of it. Any other questions? Oh, after you explain pushback, can you explain Visual Studio? Is Visual Studio as easy as installing? It can be. Yeah, um, it's a kind of a big installation. But if you have Windows, just Google Visual Studio, uh, download it. I've never taught to use it, and I'll, I'll go over how to use it. It's pretty straightforward. The only thing, and I didn't, I didn't have time, but I did want to do it. Um, how do I close this? Uh, hopefully, everybody got this. It's going to be on a recording anyway, so you can go back and look at it. Um, the only thing I didn't go over was command line arguments, which is why I used this. Um, that's not very straightforward in Visual Studio. If, if you remember it later, just because I do have a class, um, I have Mac. Oh yeah, don't, don't use Visual Studio on Mac. It's a completely different program. Um, they name it the same, but it does completely different things. Don't use it for this class. Use uh, Visual Studio Code instead. It's really confusing, but it, a Visual Studio Mac is for app development strictly. I don't know why they named it the same. It's kind of bizarre. Um, if you have Windows, though, definitely get it. Oh, Visual Studio Code is on all three. Uh, Linux, Mac, Windows. Um, if you are using it, the only thing I have to mention is if you go to uh, Project and then Properties, this is how you have to do command line arguments. You have to go to Debugging, and then they're right here, and you just type them in like you normally would. Um, I think that's not very obvious, and it sometimes takes a while to Google that. Um, so just keep that in mind. 
Uh, I just use the terminal here. When in doubt, just compile it on Sally. But it is as nice as, I think I have this set up as already. If I went to project, C-section properties, and then I went to debugging and I typed in sample1.txt output.txt, how do we get that file with Sally? Uh, use, use a file transfer client. So something like winscp filezilla. Um, yeah, you should, you should probably have had one from 135, hopefully. I think everybody used winscp in that class. Okay, la last thing. Um, the easy thing about Visual Studio is I literally just click that play button, and it should compile it for me and then run it. Yeah, you'll see here. Oh, unfortunately, it does close uh, pretty much immediately, but it just ran the program. I uh, gave up teaching us Visual Studio because he couldn't figure it out during the lab. It, it's a little strange to work around with sometimes. Um, it does create a directory, Sublime for editing code in Ubuntu. That's probably good. Yeah, if you have a, a reliable machine that you can run like a Ubuntu VM on, go for that too. Uh, I don't know where this just compiled to debug. Did I miss it? Oh, there it is. Yeah, you'll see it just ran the program and put output in this file and then it output it like it's supposed to. Um, yeah, so Visual Studio is nice because you can just keep doing that and it's also nice because it has a debugger built into it. So if I hit F9 on my keyboard right now, you'll notice it puts like a little red block and if I run the program, this is why it's amazing and you should use it. It's running the program. You'll notice it, it hit continue here. I can go line by line by hitting this button up at the top and see what my code is doing. It shows me the variables down at the bottom. This is what I is, this is what J is, this is what sort it is. So you can use it to like easily tell what everything is without doing a bunch of print statements and recompiling and all that stuff. Um, so it comes with a debugger. So, you know, use Visual Studio or Visual Studio Code, please. I beg of you, it'll make your life easier. I know it's, it's hard to get around the learning curve, but it's super useful. Okay, uh, I think that's all I have to say. Any last questions? Just, uh, I have a class at 11.30, so I do have to bail. Sorry, I don't, I don't mean to cut, like, anybody off, but I do have to go. All right. Sweet. Last thing, just remember to join the Discord, and I think I will see everybody Wednesday. And we'll go over uh, function overloading and probably classes. And if you have questions, ask them in the Discord. I'll try to respond to you as quickly as possible. All right. See you guys later. Is this recording? Yeah, it is. I'll upload it probably in the afternoon if I have time. Uh, I unfortunately have to go to campus. So if I have time before then, I'll, I'll upload it.